Good evening, everyone. This is Nicholas Sarwark, uh, Chairman of the Libertarian Party. Thank you for joining us for another Libertarian Party TV town hall. Um, tonight, we're going to cover uh, an industry that has been hit very hard by COVID-19, uh, the restaurant and bar industry, the hospitality industry, took a massive hit uh, in the midst of a pandemic where uh, an infection is transmitted by crowds. The, some of the first orders and CDC guidance about not having people go to bars or restaurants really hit that industry hard. Um, we wanted to talk to people who are in that industry, either as restaurant or tavern owners, or as servers on the front lines who are not able to make their living anymore to see how they're adapting, to see how they're coping, to see what they think about um, how we move forward from this and really talk about how the economy is changing, what kind of economic dislocations people are feeling in the hospitality industry, um, what they think the future is gonna bring and you know what it means that we have this huge spike in unemployment, why um, that's important and what is possibly gonna happen afterwards. Uh, if anyone's been watching the news, you've probably seen in the last three weeks, unemployment applications, new applications for unemployment benefits have gone up to almost 17 million uh, across the country. And it's running about 6 million a week. And that is a huge number. It's a shocking number, uh, but it's not an unexpected number because if you have entire industries and segments that are no longer able to operate, the people in those industries are going to be laid off. That's just a natural occurrence that's going to happen. And we need to figure out how do we get through this. So our first guest tonight is a member of the Libertarian National Committee, Stephen Nicola, uh, who is a um, not only a member of the National Committee, but he's also a restaurant owner and operator. And Stephen, uh, welcome to LPTV. Do you want to tell people what restaurants you have and, and how they've been affected? Certainly, and thank you for having me on today, Nick. Uh, uh, it's an honor uh, to join everyone. And uh, I am a franchisee for Wendy's Dairy Queen, and we also have the Island Grill, which is a full-service restaurant in Um And we've been operating in the Keys and North Carolina for uh, the last over 20 years now. And we've never seen anything quite like this through hurricanes and everything else. There's never been uh, such a severe business interruption uh, quite like this. And uh, the Florida Keys, where, where I'm, 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 I'm actually from, I'm up here in North Carolina because we're opening up a brand new Wendy's in Moyoc. Uh, so we're just up here for the week to, to see that through, um, <clears throat> which in itself has been an interesting challenge, but we're, we're, we're eager to be open. And uh, uh, back in the Keys, things are just absolutely devastating. About 90% of our economy is in the service industry. And when you take away the tourists, you take away uh, the businesses, the restaurants, the hotels, the bars, uh, everybody's affected. Even even the, the secondary businesses like the, the travel industry or the water sports or the fishing, um, our economy has been, been, been devastated pretty hard. And uh, the majority of workers down in the Keys have been furloughed. Uh, most of the people I know are out of work and are currently uh, either attempting government assistance, which at this time has been almost impossible. Uh, the Republicans uh, even called our Florida's current reemployment website uh, a shit sandwich, which it most certainly is. Uh, people are trying to log in just to get reemployment assistance uh, by logging in at four thirty in the morning, trying to get in. The website's broken, and so so it's a pretty nasty situation. But uh, one thing's for certain: a lot of businesses are are certainly struggling to get through these times, and uh, it, it's 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 there, a lot of them are not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right now, we're in survival mode, as are uh, a lot of the employees. And, and currently, us down in the Keys, we're still recovering from Hurricane Irma, which hit in 2017 financially. Uh, we're still recovering. Uh, the Island Grill restaurant uh, is still being rebuilt from the hurricane. And we're actually planning to uh, move that to, to early next year, despite opening now, which wouldn't make any sense. Uh, food banks in in the in South Florida are uh, four to 800% uh, over regular capacity and they're struggling to meet demand because workers are sick and uh, they're using the excess from the agricultural sector uh, to to fuel uh, a lot of a lot of those those care packages um, but but currently it's a, it's it's a tough situation 
So uh, if you could, just as a business owner who's in the, the restaurant industry, walk me through the timeline of what you were doing. Um, you know, when did you start seeing some impact from COVID-19? Uh, was it not until there were executive orders or were you seeing something before that? And what does the timeline look like for you? So with COVID-19, you know, I, I, I was following this development since January, but it didn't really come to effect until about around March 14th was the weekend where, where you know, it really hit the fan. That's that's when the changes really started taking place. Uh, about the middle of March, uh, my, my girlfriend who works down at the Southernmost Beach Resort down in Key West, uh, they're, they're a high-end resort there. And typically around that time, they see near 100% capacity. So they were starting to be a little bit slower. It was still a busy time. But they were down uh, slightly. Uh, we did have a lot of the the more uh, uh, regular hotels like Hilton and Marriott. They were uh, full of spring breakers, and so the spring break business was booming. Um, around that time, the uh, the cruise line industry decided to stop entering the port of Key West. So that that immediately took us down a peg. We expect about a hundred thousand. Uh, uh, passengers to come off the cruise ships every month in Key West during our, our, our busy season. And, and without that, we immediately felt the impact uh, right around the time when, well, the city of the Monroe County and the city of Key West started passing ordinances to cut down on tourism and to cut down on uh, the bars and restaurants and alcohol sales. So they actually on, on uh, uh, it was on the, uh, the day of St. Patrick's Day, they decided to close down all the bars at five o'clock. So here he was, everybody was in Deval Street, dressed up in green and, and ready to go out and drink and have a good time. All these spring breakers, young people, you know, going out to have a party. And, and then at five o'clock, the bars uh, closed and people started leaving. And from there, we saw a gradual decline day after day. Uh, restaurants were still allowed to sell alcohol. They ended that over the following days. And uh, they continued to clamp down on restaurants to be carry out only. And then non-essential businesses were forced to shut down uh, until finally, at, as we speak, there's actually a roadblock uh, coming into the Keys that only residents are allowed in. And anybody who flies in has to self-quarantine for 14 days. So the situation escalated dramatically. And, uh, and currently, there's a lot of uh, businesses that are, that are temporarily closed and, and people that are out of work. What have you done as a business owner with regard to your employees? Um, you know, did you try and keep everybody on staff? And tell me about how that decision making process worked mm -hmm. for you. Certainly. So in the restaurant industry, your profit margin is about 10 percent, less than 10 percent. Typically, uh, your labor cost at any given time, uh, we shoot for 32 percent is the industry average. And that includes payroll taxes, uh, which, which are a big part of that. And um and obviously, when, when sales decrease, you have employees that uh, that that they're not getting paid any less. So immediately, we have to decide decide you know we need to cut hours. Uh, so we go based off of volume. And uh, right off the bat, during during the the peak of the crisis, I, or I guess really right now, up till now, we've seen about a forty percent decrease in sales over our seasonal uh, averages. Uh, so we're down quite a bit in the QSR, which is the fast food uh, world. Uh, so we, we've had to make decisions to uh, conserve labor because this really is survival mode uh, for businesses. Uh, so we've had to make tough decisions about cutting hours, cutting staff, um, referring people to, uh, fortunately, to the reemployment system. And hopefully they get a reemployment check if they can actually get through the website and, and get set up, which is uh, so far no one I know has gotten gotten a reemployment uh, benefit. And, and the majority of folks can't even get on a website. So it's, it's a huge disaster. Um, but, but you know, businesses need to conserve as much cash flow as possible. So there's a lot of going to the banks to refinance, to ask for, uh, for uh, 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 deferral, deferred interest payments only or forbearances. Uh, so, you know, businesses are, are, are trying to pull every trick in the book to try to uh, maximize cash flow and minimize their overhead. Uh, we've cut down on trash pickups per week. We've uh, we've done everything we can to nickel and dime our way uh, through the situation and that has included cutting labor, unfortunately. So I just want to, you know, kind of step back and put this into a little bit of perspective for people. I did not know this, but apparently there's over a million restaurants in the United mm -hmm. States, which is about one restaurant for every 330 people. Um, 
and you were telling me before the show, can you just share with people how, how many restaurants fail in the first year or the second year? What's the normal failure rate for a restaurant uh, if, if one opens and, and what drives that if there's not an infectious pandemic? Certainly. Uh, during the good times, the average failure rate for a restaurant during the first year is 80%. And the uh, 80 to 90%, I think it's 80 to 90%. And then during the three years after that, uh, it's 80% of that 10%. So it's, the failure rate's 90% in the first year for restaurants. And then it's 80% of the, the 10% that, that survived that first year go out of business. So the, the failure rate for restaurants is very high. And the reason why is because the, the restaurant industry requires a lot of capital expenditure to get started. Um, you know, profitability is, is key because in the restaurant industry, we, we have two main variables. You have your food costs and you have your labor costs. And if you don't control those two variables and keep your expenses in line, a failure is, is very, very easy. Uh, and then when you compound that with your payroll taxes and your liquor licenses and everything else, you know, things, things add up. Uh, a lot of people have the misconception that in QSR and fast food, that we're, we're making millions of dollars a year and we're, we're making all profit, which is simply uh, not true. Uh, you know, we, we go based off of survival and, and in reality, our profit margins are very low, uh, if any. So in, in other countries that, you know, people have told me that we don't, they don't have the same kind of restaurant requirements with, you know, large dining rooms and lots of licenses and big kitchens and lots of staffing and parking and all that. Um, there's a whole industry in other countries where somebody puts uh, pictures of food on Instagram or a little abuela in her, um, you know, house makes tamales and then people send an email or make a phone call or she just goes around the neighborhood. That's not something that we see a lot in the United States. Do you see that as being something that we might see more of as we come into an environment where people don't want to go out into crowds as much? Um, I, I would hope so. I, I, I think um, definitely the industry is making a move towards uh, towards carry out and delivery, which has already been gaining steam in the last few years. Uh, companies like DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats have been getting a, a huge market share. And in some cities, you actually have what's called dark kitchens. And dark kitchens are restaurants, let's say like Wendy's, where you would have just the kitchen and it would only be delivery. So there'd be no physical uh, restaurant to go to, but it would only be delivery. Uh, so so certainly those options, I think, are the future. I think uh, businesses are adapting to the new environment. Uh, carry out is... Uh, a lot of businesses have been adapting to carry out during the pandemic to uh, decrease the chances of infection. Delivery has been the main driver during these times where a business has normally, you know, uh, what, you know, they're probably down to about five to 10% normal capacity is doing probably all carry out or, and delivery business uh, or mostly delivery business. Uh, as far as being able to just, you know, text your neighbor or somebody making a pie or, or something and putting it up on, uh, on Facebook Marketplace and, and having them deliver it, uh, I, those things would be great. But unfortunately, they're they're very. It, it is a highly regulated industry in a lot of ways, and and, and I hope we can see uh, some more community uh, sharing of resources in that way, where people can help each other without having to worry about repercussions. But uh, industry wise, I, we're definitely uh, heading towards I think more delivery centric, and unfortunately, we've had to take a crash course in that for a lot of businesses that don't normally uh, deliver. You know, um, what do you see as sort of the positive aspects of this or what do you see as the light at the end of the tunnel? Um, you know, a lot of people are really, we're in the middle of it right now. We're in the crisis and a lot of people are getting pretty down. So what do you see as the light at the end of the tunnel? And is there anything that you yourself are doing to try and help the people who are in your industry or, you know, whether directly or indirectly, um, what are you doing to try and help people in the community as the government kind of keeps failing in helping anybody? Absolutely. Well, you, you know, we had a, a local newspaper reach out to us the other day. They're actually running ads for all the businesses, uh, free ads to tell, you know, to say what businesses are open. Uh, we gave them a whole, the whole office, a bunch of Frosties and chicken nuggets as appreciation. Uh, I see a lot of businesses coming together. I see a lot of businesses donating uh, excess food to food banks. I see a lot of businesses that are out in the community giving away free food on their front porch. 
Uh, I, I see a lot of people coming together. Uh, I see a lot of uh, the the, na- the NRA, uh, the other NRA, the National Restaurant Association, is giving away five hundred dollar grants to people in the industry to help support them. Uh, a lot of the corporates, the corporate offices, or the corporate, you know, uh, like Prairie's Wendy's corporate, Dairy Queen corporate, they're doing what they can to sort masks for employees, thermometers, things like that to keep our customers and our crew safe. Uh, so we're, we're trying to do what we can right now in the moment uh, to get us through this as safely as possible. Um, and and I think, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel here is, that, you know, we, we had this in 1918 and we got through this. And, and it, it, I think the 1918 Spanish flu was actually a lot worse than this was. And we managed to get through it and we'll get through it again. And I think what we're going to see is probably a lot of chip to new technology in the future, like delivery that we mentioned and uh uh, other ways to minimize the interactions between uh, people for, you know, for, for hygienic purposes. I think a lot of full service restaurants are going to open, uh, you know, with people apart in the restaurant and things like that uh, to, to minimize any kind of uh, infection. So, you know, I think, I think right now it's, it's hard to, to see any light at the end of the tunnel, but I think there will be uh, some restructuring here that, that could potentially change the way that we, we eat out. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Stephen, for for joining us. We're going to keep you around, but I want to talk to um, Mike Kane, uh, who is down in the Florida Keys. He is a, a bartender in Key West, or he was up until recently a bartender in Key West. Um, you know, he's been uh, also shifting into the real estate business, and uh, you know, I just wanted to get a sense from Mike. Uh, you know, what is it? What was it like being on that? behind the bar, you know, being a server uh, rather than an owner when everything hit. And uh, let us know, Mike, uh, just unmute your microphone first. All right. So uh, thank you, Nick, for having me on. I I think the thing is here, what's going on is that everybody needs to understand the keys are uh, all dependent on tourism and tourism is represents roughly 85% of our economy down here. And we do have a slower time of the year, which is typically the end of summer and early fall. And what we have uh, are a few busy months, February, March, April, and May, that really constitute about 60 to 70% of our revenues down here are all made during that time. And when the governor shut down uh, all bars, which I happen to be working at one part time. It was it was a true shock. It really was. And uh, it, it really just uh, maybe just take a step back and think, what are we going to do next? And so it was a shock to say the least. But yeah, it was uh, it's, it's really it's really terrible. Um, there's a lot of people down here that are already living paycheck to paycheck. Um, they're just doing what they can do to try to stay on this island. And, uh, a lot of those people, unfortunately will be leaving. So, yeah. Um, with the other bartenders that, you know, uh, what are they doing to try and get through this with, you know, just basically their job or at least the job that they did have is not something that works right now. What are they doing to adapt and what are they doing to help each other? Um, are they getting any help from the government? What What are you seeing with, you know, your friends who are also in the same spot? Most people are trying to file for unemployment, but have had such a bad experience with uh, the website that they're not able to. Uh, unfortunately, just our, our economy down here is so based on tourism. Uh, right now, for example, when we talk about helping each other out and, and trying to get through this, uh, for example, the bar I work at, we have live music. Uh, from open to close every single day. And the musicians are now getting on and they're doing live streams, which is great. And they're taking online tips. But unfortunately, that's that's really just a small portion. Uh, the bartenders I know are all just basically living off their savings. And I do know a few that have already, they have already left and they're, and they're leaving uh, the area. So due to high cost of, of living down here. So has anyone that you know, have they shifted into, um, you know, things that are, are growing right now, things like delivery or, you know, 
whether it be grocery or package or, you know, restaurant delivery services, things like that. Have you seen anybody trying to shift to other jobs? And is that something that that is even viable in a place that is so tourist driven when you can't really have tourists? Well, it's funny. Uh, we always joke about uh, down here. Uh, everybody works two jobs, um, myself included. Uh, but I have seen a few friends that were already driving Uber. Now they're moving to Uber Eats. Um, so to answer your question, yes. Um, but those are the people that are already pretty much set up on it. Uh, there's really not much else to do uh, in terms of, of, of that. So. And has that so your other job is, uh, you know, real estate. Have you seen what is that doing to the real estate market in a tourist place like Key West? Is that something that more people are wanting to come down there or are fewer people wanting to come down there or get a second house or something like that? Well, we haven't seen any prices move uh, considerably either way. And I have a strong inclination that's because of the interest rates being where they are. Uh, historical lows. So it should be interesting. But just to note, getting back to my point about how everybody has two jobs down here, my wife, she's a full time teacher. She teaches at a charter school in Key West. And her second job uh, is she's the sales coordinator for a catering company. Now, the catering company is run by a friend of ours who also owns a few restaurants and he runs the catering company out of, out of the uh, kitchen there. And it's been uh, due to the shutdown here. Uh, there's been no new bookings whatsoever and nothing but cancellations and reschedules. So my wife who works on, a, on that isn't earning any income from herself as a wedding sales coordinator as her part-time job, which was actually a very lucrative thing for her. Yeah, it, it, it seems like, um, you know, we were talking a little bit with Stephen. One of the things that is something that it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to get away from, whether regardless of what the government orders say, is these large crowds of people don't seem like they're going to be something people want. I know I was traveling, um, you know, officially and, and for pleasure in the weeks leading up to, uh, you know, the recommendation that people not travel at all. And I was already seeing mostly empty airports and hotels that were a lot less full and just people trying to avoid crowding together. And with, you know, the the changes with the amount of death that's starting to hit. What do you see ways where some of these industries like a wedding industry or, you know, a caterer for a large party? Do you see ways that they they think they can adapt to a time when people aren't going to be wanting to get into close proximity or crowds? Um, or do you think that that's just something that might be a, a longer term change? Well, when I look at my friend who owns QS Catering Company, I have a strong inclination that he'll, he'll market uh, strictly towards more of a drop off uh, catering for small on a, on a smaller scale. But I, it's, it's really going to be impossible for him when 80 to 90 percent of his businesses are weddings and they're just not happening down here for him to to uh, to make up for that revenue. And uh, so I'm sure that he'll be able to adapt. Uh, he's very capable, but it's going to be extremely difficult. He's definitely going to have to change his uh, his target audience and his target market and and have to go from there. And what is it? been like, um, you know, being just in Key West with what's going on right now? Is it, is it really quiet? Are, are people concerned? And have you guys um, had serious impacts yet and, and had many cases? Or is it still pretty well contained um, with, you know, kind of the shutdown and not letting anybody in? Well, it, it's been extremely well contained. Uh, last I checked, there were 51 cases uh, confirmed our populate in the county. Uh, there were, uh, t uh, yeah, there were 50, uh, 50 people have tested positive uh, in the county. And actually, as a matter of fact, 24 of them were in Key West. And um, our population in Key West is 25,000 people and another 50,000 live um, in the other parts of un unincorporated Monroe County and the cities, Isla Mirada, Key Largo, and Tavernier. Marathon. 
Well, that's um, that's good. Thank you for joining us, Mike. We're going to keep you around. Uh, we'll probably do some questions uh, a little bit later. Um, this is Libertarian Party Television. This is LPTV. Every Thursday night uh, at 7 o'clock Eastern time, we're doing these town halls to address issues that are not otherwise going to be addressed by the media um, and provide a libertarian perspective on issues that are really important to people and talk to libertarians who have expertise and experience. And the next person I'd like to talk to um, is Cole Ebel, uh, owner of Ebel's Tavern in Tennessee. Cole, thanks for joining us on LPTV. Hey, thanks, Nick. Appreciate y'all having me on tonight. Um, Cole, tell us, you know, you have a, a tavern. It's uh, where in Tennessee are you? Is is your business super seasonal and tourist based or is it you have a little bit different situation from uh, Stephen and, and Mike? It's somewhat tourist based. Uh, springtime, summertime is is a big time for us. We're on the confluence of uh, two rivers, about an hour out east of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Nashville is a huge tourist town, um, and so we definitely rely on that business. Um, so it does hit us on the tourist aspect, but most of all, it really it really cuts into our community aspect. Um, our restaurant really does serve the community. Um, it's a place where we all get together, we talk, we, uh, we drink, we socialize. Um, and, um, it's, it really is a family environment and literally we're being, uh, mandated that we, uh, no longer have this, uh, family environment. So what have you done to adapt now that you're not able to have people come into the tavern and, and sit down and enjoy a drink or a meal with each other? What what did you do both, you know, kind of from a business owner perspective, um, you know, and then also, you know, what have you done to try and adapt to serve the community? You know, uh, you guys have been there for what, three years now? Yes. Yeah, so we've been here. We're coming up on three years. Um, the way we've adapted is uh, we've instituted delivery. Uh, we, we have a pretty large county with a pretty small population. Um, and so, but we are instituting a full countywide delivery system. Um, we've had to lay off, um, a lot of our servers. I'm able to bring one in on the weekends cause it's a little bit busier to help with to go orders. 100% of our delivery fees go to our drivers, which are pretty much cooks. And, um, and then, you know, we're just, I I'm basically, uh, fighting to keep, uh, my employees fed, uh, to keep, uh, food on the table for them, uh, keep money on the table for them. Um, to go has been a big thing. We do have a patio. Um, uh, we cannot serve on that patio, but, uh, if you happen to decide that you want to eat your meal there, we're not going to kick you out e either. So, um, those are a few of the things that we've been doing on, on the uh, tavern side of things. And from the tavern side, you know, one of the things that, the tavern culture in America has been around for a long time. And, and it's the idea of going and having drinks with other people. Have you been able to um, still provide people drinks that they can enjoy, even though they're not able to stay there and enjoy them? How, what are you doing to adapt to that? Because I know a lot of, um, you know, food and beverage locations, restaurants, taverns like that, liquor and other alcohol sales are a big part of your revenue stream. So have you been able to adapt to that in this takeout delivery kind of era? Absolutely. Um, and, and just to give a shout out to a new upcoming business that's trying to move in um, is a, a local business uh, called The Filling Station, who they've uh, generously uh, donated quite a few growlers uh, to the tavern. Um, I've had friends all over the state who have donated growlers. Um, basically, growlers are uh, uh, glass containers that can hold beer is what they're designed for. But we've, we've gone ahead and, uh, uh, um, accented that with, uh, we're doing to go margaritas. We're doing to go, uh, rum runners. We're, uh, delivering, we're basically advertising. We're going to deliver a rum runner right to your door. And so that's been helping. Um, many people have been very supportive. Um, again, we've got a very strong community here, very supportive people. But what, I, what really honestly worries me is, uh, when this accordion comes back in on itself, um, the people who are not retired, the people who are still uh, living off of an income, when they don't have money to spend on um, things like a tavern, because again, we're an industry that is is a choice industry. Um, it provides for a lot of people, but it is a choice. It's not a necessity. So um, being a little bit of the higher price um, area, being a five-star restaurant, um, 
those choices will minimize. Now, um, you know, one of the things that uh, healthcare workers have have had to face, especially in hard hit places like New York City or Italy, is you know this idea of triage medicine, where you have to make choices about who can survive and who doesn't get to survive, and the emotional cost of that. And you know, we talk about the restaurant industry in these numbers and this abstract of this many million restaurants and this this many fail and all of that, but what is it like when you have to make those decisions as a, a tavern owner of who gets to keep hours and who do, doesn't get to keep hours, who gets laid off and who doesn't get laid off? Can you just talk to people about what that's like from a more personal level? Absolutely. I mean, first off, our uh, my employees are my biggest asset. They're, they're my biggest investment. I put a lot of investment into them, uh, both financially and both, you know, as far as just they're people. They're, they're real people. These, these are real people being affected. Um, so I have to start triaging people I care about. Uh, the first ones I had to take off were the servers because I can't serve. It's illegal right now for me to serve. Um, and it's, it's, it's devastating to them. So that's the first people. Then I start triaging off um, people who are supporting or, or, you know, going to college if they're still living with their parents. Um, those are the first people I try to let go of because then there's people who are supporting themselves. But then after that, if it's someone who's supporting themselves versus supporting a family, um, I've got to let go of the person who's indep- independently supporting themselves because at the end of the day, I have to pick um, who has the most people they're supporting. And then uh, the next step goes being that we're at about 50 percent right now is um, I don't want to fire anybody. I don't want to shut down. But then I have to start cutting. I- I'd-, I'd rather cut pay than fire someone, uh, I- you know. And um, being that we're um, we had the restaurant statistics earlier, we're a new restaurant. Um, we're not in the uh, we're not in the black yet. We're still in the red. And so um, this is just diving us further into the red. I'm I'm not making any money at this. I hope to one day again. It's an investment, but I, at this point, it's just survival. It's just trying to keep food on the table for uh, my employees. Now, and with with that kind of you know, challenge, what, what are you seeing as far as the government response to what's going on versus what's, you know, you're in a smaller community in Tennessee. What are you seeing with the voluntary community response to, you know, kind of getting through this for people who might be older and, you know, needing to self-isolate people who are running into, you know, their job just went away what what are you seeing in your community and what do you think is being done right? What do you think could be done better? Well, first off, uh, Carthage, Tennessee is a city of uh, 2,300 people. We're not New York City. Um, our county could fit in 14 uh, city blocks of New York City. That's our entire county of um, 950 square miles uh, compared to just a few square miles in New York City. We're, we're different and we should be treated differently as far as regulations go. But what you're looking at is you're looking at a response from the government that is completely fear driven. They're looking at one small piece of the pie. They're looking at the piece of the pie that says, um, hey, let's just listen to uh, the CDC over here. And the CDC who's botched this and botched that and botched this. OK, well, let's listen to the FDA who's basically come out and um, fought against any private industries that are trying to get tests out, who saw what was coming, um, that's coming up. And then as far as the community goes, the reaction for the community, um, you've got your, um, uh, you've got your people out there who are always, you know, that are the nosy people. They're, they're out, uh, sitting here saying, Oh, I saw so-and-so at Walmart today. I can't believe they'd be out there. And, and you're, you're telling yourself, what are you doing out there? You know? And, um, it's, it's just a, you know, You got this Karen mentality, if you know what I'm saying. And um, but most of the other community, I mean, they're sick of it. We're we're looking at a situation where May 1st um, and this is just a prediction of mine. May 1st, either they open it back up or I mean, we're looking at a um, uh, unofficially we're looking at speakeasies popping up and that's what's going to happen. So one of the things that that has been very frustrating, you know, I've been watching this early on and and the Libertarian Party was out in front of calling for more testing, you know, weeks before even any of the lockdowns happened. Um, the, the communication from the government hasn't been very clear. 
You know, they haven't used clear, plain language and said, hey, if you cough or sneeze, you could infect somebody. Don't be in close physical proximity. Don't stay in, you know, confined spaces with air. If you wear a mask or a bandana, it stops you from infecting other people. It doesn't protect you, but it's a good thing to do as a good neighbor. None of that stuff has come out or it's come out so far after the fact that what I've heard from a lot of people is they hear these orders about what you're allowed to do, but they don't understand what's behind the order. And that leads to, you know, kind of a resentment or a concern that this isn't really something that, that they should be concerned about. And I know you are involved in, in local government there. What, what is your government in, uh, in Tennessee? What, what are they doing and what could they do better on that? Well, I mean, basically on our local government level, I'm on the city council. Uh, my wife's on the uh, county commission. Um, so we're pretty involved on that level. Uh, w- we were one of the first counties to have a task force out. Um, a gentleman of the name of Dr. Duke has been just, he's been very informational. Um, he hasn't necessarily put his opinions out. He's literally just putting facts out, which has been helpful. But uh, politicians, uh, the, the way I've been seeing it, it's been completely reactive. Um, it's been completely, let, let's let uh, put everything in one big package and throw that at the population because everyone's different. If you look at the statistics and you start reading into the numbers, there are some people that absolutely should isolate. They shouldn't go out right now. And that's, that's a fact. And then there's a lot of people who sh- should be out there and they should be working and they should be driving this economy along because what we're looking at is, again, one small piece of the pie that is just a small part of just the medical side. You're completely ignoring, you want to talk about triage, you're completely ignoring other triage, essential surgeries um, or voluntary surgeries that um, pay bills at the hospital that keep people fed. Um, You're looking at huge economic impacts that no one's even started to look at. You're looking at um, political maneuvering. And again, it's not saying that the people who aren't taking this virus seriously, we're, we're taking it seriously. But that doesn't mean that we ignore uh, these other key areas over here, these other key areas over here. We can, we, you know, we have peripheral vision. We can look everywhere and be vigilant of everything. Um, but what you're, what you're seeing in this, this current climate is fear. Everything is fear-based. It's completely fear-driven. And fear is the blindness of caution. Fear is the blindness of logic. Then there's no government response that I'm seeing anywhere aside from one uh, Republican senator that decided, hey, maybe we should read this bill. Other than that, it's been completely fear driven. Yeah. Well, one of the things you brought up is, you know, Carthage, Tennessee versus New York City is is incredibly tiny. But you also have this issue of, you know, you've got state government, you've got a governor in Tennessee and they're, I would imagine, making decisions based on the population centers, based on places like Nashville. And what makes sense for Nashville, where you have high population density, high traffic, what one of the things that libertarians have been pushing for a long time is this idea that individuals know how to best make decisions about their own life and lower levels of government may have better knowledge about what the situation is in their community and be able to adapt in different ways. Do you have is your either the county commission or the city council, are they able to communicate with the governor and propose different ways to do things. I know here in New Hampshire, you know, some of our local officials have been able to have a good dialogue with the governor and say, this doesn't make sense necessarily outside of the population centers, or this is what you're not seeing about how we live life out here. Maybe there's something you can change. Maybe there's something you can do differently. Are are you guys having that conversation or are they not listening? Well, I, I would say this, that, um, Obviously, being the libertarians in town, um, you know, we're we're kind of we're kind of judged differently, if that makes sense. But that doesn't mean that we are not involved on the state level. Um, Most of my uh, state level in the past has been uh, operating off of ballot access. Most recently, uh, CBD and THC cannabis uh, lobbying is what we've done. But as far as those uh, messages getting out there, um, I'm literally here in Carthage as a councilman and I'm being alerted by Facebook that I'm not having a council meeting. Um, we are not even getting emails on it until the last minute. 
Um, so I, I've got some preparedness issues um, that I'm looking at doing um, as far as the city goes. Um, one thing that I'd like to do, we, we've been operating off of uh, these Second Amendment sanctuary cities. Um, we wor worked on some legislation on that. Uh, it did get voted down, but I'm looking at some, you know, possibly some other sanctuary resolutions that basically say, yeah, we don't want to comply with uh, the state's mandates on this because, yes, it is tough here in Nashville. It is tough here in Memphis, but we're not Nashville. We're not Memphis. We live out here for a reason. We have an economy out here that's different. Um, we subsidize a lot of y'all's economy, but right now, uh, you're not giving us anything to subsidize. We just want to live our lives. And if someone's sick, they should go home. If they're, if uh, everyone should be washing their hands regardless with hot water, everyone should be drinking hot beverages regardless. Um, it's just common sense. And they're forcing a um, full boxed package of, hey, isolate unless you're 10 feet away or isolate unless you're essential or isolate. And it's just the science doesn't add up. It doesn't. And I think, you know, that that raises this issue. Um, everybody knows what's essential to them. And, yeah. and it's different what's essential to you versus what's essential to somebody else. And the problem with governments making lists of essential workers is then it becomes really important who gets to make the list. And, you know, one of the things that just to tap into something we talked about on an earlier uh, edition of the show if you had good testing for antibodies to know who had been exposed to COVID-19 and had already recovered, you could test an entire community of 2,300 uh, at, at relatively low expense and actually do what is a much better way to deal with a pandemic disease, which is the, the test and trace model, where if somebody gets sick, you figure out who they had contact with and you kind of isolate those people you don't isolate everybody because you don't know anything. And I think one of the frustrations a lot of us have had is this, this flattening the curve is to buy time. Uh, it's, it's to buy time because we, we had a government that didn't do anything. But what we've done now is we bought time and we still don't have massive testing. We're testing less than 150,000 people a day in the country. You know, we bought time and the federal government is shutting down the drive through testing centers. They're running out of the stockpiles they said they had, and they're not really doing the testing that, that's necessary. So I think that's part of where the frustration comes is, you know, they said, trust us, and they're not doing anything with the time that we're buying at great personal cost. Um, I want to kind of open it up to, to questions from, you know, the audience and kind of bring in everybody. Uh, the first thing I want to I ask, you know, um, we'll just go and order Cole and then Steven and then Mike, um, or actually Cole and Mike, then Steven, cause it's reverse order of what we started. Uh, what are you seeing as far as support from customers, you know, either patrons of the tavern, um, other people around, uh, are they reaching out to you? Are they trying to help you as a business that they value, even though they can't use, use your services right now, or at least not at the same level? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've got a phenomenal customer base. I, I, I don't know. We would not exist without them. They've shown us nothing but love, support. They're buying gift cards. Um, they're going out of their way to spend quite a bit of money with us. Um, and I, I, I see their checks typically and they're not as much as they are right now. They're, they're really reaching out and and it's 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 very heartfelt. Um, one thing I do know that people can do for their local restaurants is if if they're not operating, buy some gift cards from them. If they are operating, just try to uh, try to support them at least once a week. Um, and that doesn't mean you're one restaurant. You probably ha everyone has five or six local restaurants. Spread it out. Spread the wealth out and do it voluntarily. Uh, Mike, what are, what are you seeing as far as um, you know how the community is reacting to the the bartenders that they know and love and um, you know, what are they doing for each other or for you guys? Well, I have seen uh, quite a few of my colleagues um, have also, they've all been getting, uh, a lot of people have been buying them beer and dropping food and beer and alcohol off at the house for them, which has been very nice. We have we have seen a lot of local restaurants uh, giving away food I, every single day. Uh, there are people, uh, business owners, restaurant owners, in the community, they're giving food away for, for lunch and dinner. So just to make sure that people aren't going hungry. And it's funny how hard the restaurants are being hit, especially down here, how uh, 
how generous uh, that they, they've been. And I mean, just, just today, I know uh, a friend of mine gave out over 400 meals for free. So it's the, the outreach has been very good to the community. I, I love to hear that story about, you know, people helping each other. Stephen, what are you, what are you seeing as far as the community um, trying to support you or your staff uh, in this time? Well, um, I see, you know, the community in Key West is very strong. People are banding together. Uh, we have somebody that we know that's actually making cloth masks for us right now, which is, which is a great service. Uh, customers are, are expressing their appreciation, sending us reviews, letting us know that they, they appreciate the hard work we're putting in during these times. And, uh, and, and we appreciate our customers. And so, um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been positive so far. People are just trying to get through it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I want to, you know, this service, this ability to just hear from people who are libertarians, who are out there in the community, who are dealing with this stuff is really valuable because, you know, one of the things people have talked about is this idea that it, it's called social distancing because that's what they decided to call it. But scientifically, really what it is, is physical distancing, right? Because viruses can't walk by themselves. They only move when we move. Um, what we're trying to do with this is, is have less social distancing where we're still able to connect with each other, to know that there are other people who are in these similar situations, who may have different ideas to let everybody know that we're trying to support each other. Um, you know, and we're going to keep doing this. I want to thank, I just want to shout out to Justin Heinrich for, you know, contributing to the Libertarian Party so that we can keep having these broadcasts, keep getting some of these messages out that maybe aren't going to be the biggest, um, you know, they're not going to be what's in the news, right? The news is talking about what the government's going to do or what the government's not going to do. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, Kara asks a, a really good question, I think, and this one's probably for, let's say, Stephen and then, and then uh, Cole, because you guys have full service restaurant things. What's reopening day look like? And, and what are you going to do differently about the dining room or the bar area? How will the floor plan look different uh, to be able to be successful once we loosen up some of these, you know, these guidelines and it's able for people to come out and be in crowds again, or at least be out and about in restaurants and taverns? Certainly. So uh, our, our full service restaurant, the Island Grill, was supposed to be open this summer. Uh, we've delayed it until Q1 next year when hopefully this will be over. We're still in the rebuilding process, which is its own can of worms with uh, government red tape uh, there, which you wouldn't even believe. We've got every government agency uh, coming out of the woodwork uh, that, that we need to comply with just to get that level. But we've uh, <clears throat> pushed that back till Q1. And my prediction is going to be during the reopening process, I think well into next year and probably for a long time to come, People are wanting to continue to physically distance. People are going to be wanting to, uh, you know, get back to some semblance of normalcy while still maintaining uh, some safety precautions. And so I'm certain that we've, we've got a ton of seats in the restaurant. And what we'll be required to do is to uh, have our host seat customers uh, in parties uh, separate from other customers. So it might be two meters, if not more. Uh, we'll probably be putting parties that come in together together with good physical distancing um, from others. So that's that's going to be an important piece. Sanitation has been huge. Uh, so with reopening, you know, we're, we're expected and I'm sure this virus will be around by then still. Uh, sanitation has already been uh, ridiculously underway so far in the QSR restaurants that we have. Uh, we're constantly sanitizing high touch point areas like doorknobs, uh, you know, pin pads, uh, screens, things like that every 30 minutes or, or even more often. Uh, so the, the safety precautions have been huge and food safety is a huge part of our industry. So I think with the future of restaurants, full service and QSR uh, in general, and even hotels, every other, every business is taking, you know, just huge precautions to make sure that their brand or, or their business isn't the first one to be uh, you know, someone got COVID-19 after eating here uh, or the, the server here got COVID-19. You know, people people are afraid of that. Owners are afraid of that. So I think we're going to see a lot higher level of safety precautions as well as physical distancing uh, to continue uh, for the months and years ahead. What about you, Cole? What do you think it's going to look like for reopening? Well, I'm a capitalist, so I'm going to figure this one out as far as getting a, 
uh, different broad markets. I'm going to keep capitalizing on this delivery market. I'm going to keep going after that. But as far as reopening goes, we're going to go back to business as uh, uh, business as usual. Um, that's because that's what I feel people are going to want. Um, and I'm talking about our regulars, people that we sit down and we talk with all the time. These are our fa- this is our family. Um, and I know it's a big family. You know, we've got a couple hundred people in this family and we are a small restaurant, but um, we're going to open up business as usual. We're going to be full service um, and we're going to leave that voluntary um, aspect of, you know what? I don't know if I'm ready to come back out to Ebels or, um, um, you know what? I'm ready to get back. I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to go uh, hang out with everybody. We're, we're going to leave that decision up to everyone, but we're going to go ahead and uh, continue all the other services that we've been offering on top of it. And we're, we're, we're itching to get back out at it pretty soon here. Okay. Um, you know, one thing I want to just talk to all you guys about is, you know, what, what's your outlook for, for where things are going to go? Uh, you know, as we get through this, uh, a lot of experts are saying we're going to have some amount of coronavirus around in society for a year, two years. Um, what do you see as the way things are going to go? And what, what is your outlook on the situation? Let's go with Mike and then Cole and then Steven. Well, I, I firmly believe that the market uh, w- will end up mitigating all of these issues. And uh, I, I think it's really important to stress, you know, how how uh, how much ingenuity the market really has in the sense of I think that if government regulations aren't restricted, that we will move uh, towards a uh, an extra legal economy. You'll see people operating things without licenses, perform performing unlicensed work, uh, et cetera, just to feed their families. And uh, so I do see, though, uh, some some room for improvement, though, because I think governments will have to be uh, forced to, to reduce these restrictions, these undue burdens um, during this this really unique, unique situation. So. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Mike here. I, I think uh, May 1st comes um, – People are going to either they're going to come out one way or the other with government permission or without. I mean, it's it's um, it, it's not going to last this long. It, it, people are um, the government has kept people just content enough. But right now, people are starting to get uh, they're not as content. And, you know, they're going to come to a situation where either they're going to have to bend on a lot of regulations or businesses will flounder. Um, and if they don't bend on it, I mean, they're going to start looking at options for the next boogaloo, you know? <laughs> uh, what do you think, Stephen? What, what's the outlook, you know, for how things are going to be different coming out of this and, and how we're going to get through it? You know, I, I think it's, it's hard to say exactly. I think that the right answer is nobody knows, but, but what we can see from the data is that the, the resource peak that we're going to need over the next two weeks, about mid-April, is, is in the United States, is where we're going to see the most amount of use of ICU beds, ventilators, and uh, regular hospital beds uh, throughout the country. Uh, from that point, because the, the the lockdown, it's not really a quarantine, it's a lockdown, because in a quarantine, you isolate the sick people. In a lockdown, you lock down society. Uh, so because of lockdown and all the other measures that people are voluntarily taking, uh, start about two weeks ago. I, I think in probably in May towards June, we're going to see a, a drastic decrease in cases. But the problem then is uh, what's the exit plan? Because as soon as people start going back to normal, and I think people will change their behaviors, which will keep that curve nice and flat, uh, you know, things are going to increase again. There's going to be more cases. You're going to have second and third waves of infections like we had during the 1918 Spanish flu. So, I think ultimately, you know, we, we can't, it, it's a false dichotomy to choose between the coronavirus and the economy. It's, it's like, you know, choosing the lesser of two evils. It's, 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 not a real, uh, it's not a real dichotomy because I think we can look at ways that we can mitigate the problems of the COVID-19 disease uh, by looking at other countries, looking at what Japan is doing, what South Korea is doing, uh, using more trace methods and hopefully opening up to the free market. There was a laboratory in Seattle that actually had a, uh, they were doing private testing for COVID-19. The FDA and CDC shut them down, uh, but they tested anyway, and 
they found a patient who tested positive for COVID-19. They debated what to do morally, and they ended up telling the state about it. And the <laughs> CDC and FDA came back again and shut them down after they were already, you know, running tests privately for, for citizens to help in tracing. So I think the government has definitely impeded on a lot of the uh, the, 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 the space the free market could have taken up here to innovate and provide services for. The World Health Organization had a working test. Uh, there was working tests in other countries that were offered and that are even being imported now to the United States that weren't taken because the CDC had a monopoly on testing and they wanted tests for SARS and MERS and, and SARS-CoV-2 and they botched the tests and so it set us back a month and, and those things do affect us badly. In the short term, you know, in Florida, at least, the unemployment system is is just is terrible. So I don't know what people are going to do when they can't pay rent, uh, they can't pay for food, and, and they're out of work, and the government, you know, breaks their legs and, and doesn't even give them the crutch. So in the short term, I think in Florida, we're going to see a huge increase in food banks. I think donations, churches are going to have to step up because otherwise we're going to have a real uh, civil unrest on our hands. And we, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, in the midterm, I'm, I'm hoping we can get survive through the situation without ludicrous amounts of federal funding and, and money printing uh, that we pass on down to our grandkids. And in the long term, I know we will get through this. The, the 1918 Spanish flu uh, that happened, uh, you know, it, it killed more people than, than World War I. It, it was a terrible, terrible uh, influenza. And uh, I think it ravaged the world at a, at a much worse pace than, than this virus. So I'm confident at the end we'll get through this. It's just a matter of how much government interference are we going to have to face and, and what are the economic repercussions going to be. But I you think know, at the well, end there is a. Uh, thank you, Stephen. So one of the things, um, you know, that that we talk about a lot as libertarians is this idea of the economy, right? And the economy, the free market, um, things change in the market. You know, there, there aren't elevator operators anymore. There aren't. Uh, you know, travel agents is not really a thing anymore because things get different. Uber takes over from taxis. We talk about that in, in the broad way, but, you know, it's really hard to be in that economic dislocation. It, it's real people who no longer have a job who have to find a new job. It's business owners who the business that they had, it, it's not going to be an ongoing concern. One of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, we have some doors that have been shut right now. There are some doors that have been shut and there's some doors that have been opened. And we can spend a lot of effort trying to reach back and open those doors that have been shut and claw into them. You know, and that seems to be the government's response. They want to bail out industries that may have problems, you know, being viable like cruise ships. Or we can take that deep breath and look into what's possible. What new things have we not even invented yet? Uh, and walk through some of the doors that are open. And so I love what you guys are doing to, to stay positive, to help in your community. I think it's showing a lot of people that when a real crisis like this comes where you just can't throw government money at it, it does come down to people and business owners and workers working together in their own communities. Um, thank you guys for being on. This has been Libertarian Party TV. Tomorrow evening, uh, Libertarian Party Candidate Hour will be on LPTV with host Pat Ford at 8 p.m. Eastern. He's going to have Trisha Butler and Kalish Morrow. You know, be good to each other, everybody. Stay safe. Look for the helpers. Like Mr. Rogers said, find the people in your community who are doing good things and help them out. Ask for people who can, you know, who check on people, check on your friends, check on people you know, do what you can to help. And together we'll get through this. And we'll have a better, freer society at the end of it. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And thank you for the support of the Libertarian Party and LPTV.